Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We'll go to the hotline and bring on our guest this week. Karen Chapman of La Jarne is a lifelong gardener. She is also an author, speaker, landscape designer, instructor, and writer. She has contributed to a number of garden publications. As a horticulturist, she helps others solve many of their garden problems. We want to welcome you to the program today, Karen. Thank you so much. Lovely to be with you, Jerry. Well, glad to take time, glad that you've taken time out of your very busy schedule to not only join myself, but all of our listeners across the country to try to help us with some of the garden problems that uh, we face every day, not only in our, not necessarily in our vegetable garden, but on our landscape in general. My pleasure. So let, let's say someone has just moved into a, a new house and they've got landscaping design that they want to incorporate into their, their new property. Why would you find it to be wise or suggest to them to hire a landscape designer versus just looking at some pictures online and, and then going at it themselves? Sure. Well, you know, typically a designer is going to be a trained horticulturalist with extensive hands-on plant knowledge. Um, they should also be an artistic visionary, and we tend to see the possibilities where the homeowners just see the problems. Um, but I think one of the most interesting things is that designers can see in three dimensions, four seasons, and 360 degrees all at once, which means when we have to balance scale and proportion, we can see that big picture. And that's just something that comes with decades of experience. It's incredibly hard for a homeowner to grasp all of that and then select um, plants which are appropriate to their space. So we take the guesswork out and uh, make them successful. Well, and, and like you said, years of experience. You can see problems many steps before a typical homeowner would see it, and a homeowner is not going to see it until it's already happened. And you know that that's a key to anything. You want to get somebody pay a little bit up front to make sure the job is done correct, right, and you you actually have somebody that knows what they're doing. Besides, oh, I'll save a couple of dollars and do it myself. And usually, it doesn't end up as well as you'd hoped. No, I get called out so often to um, help homeowners, homeowners who've done exactly that. They've done their best, but they usually end up with this jelly bean garden, you know, one of these and one of those just in some kind of hodgepodge instead of a cohesive design. I'd say the other thing that um, designers can do is actually help um, families or couples discuss their invariably very different wish lists, although I do make the point of saying that I charge extra for marriage counseling. <laughs> um you know, you, you have a little bit of negotiation to do there as well. Uh, absolutely. Well, let, let's talk about your book, Deer Resistant Design. It's, it is very helpful. What is deer resistant? Uh, what What is a deer resistant design? What is it not? I think that's a key part of this question. And what is a great tip in which you would be willing to share with all of us in that that's in that book? Sure. I was excited to write this book because, trust me, I needed the book. That's why it got written. Um, you know, deer resistant design is one that thrives despite the presence of deer, but without resorting to fences. It's not a prison and it isn't damage free. That's something, you know, let's get people's expectations in the right place. A deer resistant design is not going to be damage free, but the damage is reduced, it's hidden or it's distracted from by some clever design tricks and wise planting choices. And those planting choices, it's not just the actual type of plants, it's also exactly where they are planted and how they are combined together. All of that um, helps to create a successful deer resistant design. But I'd say a, a key tip is actually perhaps one you may not expect because it's got nothing whatsoever to do. Here's the premise. There are masters and mistresses at creating chaos. So anything we can do to instill a sense of order puts us on the winning streak. So this is where I advise clients, you know what, invest in the hardscape, not to everything which isn't the plants. It's the patios, the pathways, the pergola, 
the deer can't eat those. They can't knock them over. They can't damage them. So every dollar that you spend on those items is a really good financial investment. But it's also something which instills a sense of order and discipline to the space, which immediately makes it look as if you're in control and not the deer. Reverse the uh, psycholo- uh, psych- psychologist uh, kind of reversal there on the deer. Uh, when you yeah. talk, when when you talk about uh, incorporating plants in there, are you kind of talking about ones that you know deer will eat, but put them in the center around plants that are less desirable that the deer may not go after? Not really. I mean, my starting point is what we all call the Rutgers list. It's that website on the Rutgers website which lists um, deer resistant plants. But it's not a black or white, you know, they are or they are not deer resistant. There's a gradation. There's actually four levels of deer resistance, A through D. And we always choose those which are A and B on that list. So we choose those which seldom or very rarely receive um, major damage. And that is our primary palette. If a homeowner is determined to grow a rose, then I'll persuade them to grow a climbing rose over an 8 to 10 foot tall pergola so that even if the deer nibble the lower um, blooms, they can't reach the main display, which is out of their range. Got it. Well, let's talk about landscape design here. When many people choose a focal point, and I think that's important when you do a landscape, you need something where your eye goes to it. Many people may choose a tree or a shrub why is this often not the best ideal, and, and what what's a better alternative than just dropping a shrub or a tree in that focal point where the homeowner thinks is the best spot? Right. And, you know, a, a beautiful specimen tree, such as a paper bark maple or something else, can be fantastic if you don't have deer. But if we're still specifically talking about, you know, if you've got deer as a problem, deer can't eat anything. And at some point, they're likely to test most things. So for a focal point, particularly in environments where deer are present, I choose something that the deer can't possibly eat or knock over. So it might be a beautiful sculptural container, um, maybe a piece of garden art. Um, It could be a structure. In my garden, I actually have a little cabin. Um, We have archways. You know, all of these can become beautiful focal points. Um, A water feature is another one, and it can be something as inexpensive as a bird bath or it can be, you know, a gushing waterfall. But these are the focal points that the deer can't damage. And using specimen trees as secondary levels of interest is fine, but don't rely on them if you have to share your garden with deer. Now, you brought up the word container. A lot of people have containers for ornamental and edible uh, plants. When somebody Mm -hmm. wants to grow an ornamental container, whether they're on a a fifth floor balcony apartment in New York or where or or on their patio porch or deck, which is better to go after finding the container first or the plant first? And is there a preferred method of the madness? and, And which would you consider choosing first the container or the plant? That's a great question, and I wish more people actually did consider this before they just hit the nurseries. The container is a key element of the design because it's often going to dictate both the style and the scale of the finished design, so it's really wise to choose that first. And it also means when you go shopping for plants, you know exactly how many you're going to need to fill it. You've already got that dimension taken care of. But when you're actually then at the nursery, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by the choices. So some of the key decisions you're going to have to make are material. You know, what are you going to use for material? You have much colder winters in Wisconsin than we do here in Seattle. So basically, high five ceramic pots. Um, you may prefer instead to go with something which is a synthetic and is lighter. Or something, if you know that you have to move it in the winter, you don't want a really heavy pot. You want something which is more manageable that you can put it into the garage, perhaps. And the flip side of that is if you're in a windy location and having a lightweight pot may not be such a good idea. So you've got some decisions to make and some considerations in terms of the material. But the next biggest one is thinking about the size. Because when you go into the nursery, you're going to see most pots are about 18 inches tall. And that's purely because the people that work in the nurseries, and I was one of them, know that you can physically take that home, even plant it, put it in your car, and you're good to go. That doesn't mean it's the right size pot to have at your front door. 
So if you think about standing at the entranceway to your home, you're going to be viewing any container garden on that porch from a standing position. You don't want to trip over the pot. You want to be at eye level to the planting. So that pot is going to be much taller than one that you might have adjacent to a chair in on the patio, perhaps. That's more likely to be at sitting height, which would be a 17, 18 inch height with the plants then coming above that. So be consideration of that. And then in terms of style and color, that again is going to be driven by what's your design preference. If you want something in contemporary, perhaps you'd be looking for a sleek gray container. If you want something more whimsical, maybe um, a whiskey barrel or a pair of old hiking boots. <laughs> Well, uh, doing the container first, and that gives you a little more self-control because you're, like you said, you're not buying a dozen and a half plants for a place that only can, that you can really realistically grow four. And then you got to figure out what you've gone, done with these other ones. And you probably spent money and they're going to die because you ain't got nowhere to put them. Yes, and then you'll do the inevitable, inevitable walk around the garden with plants in hand, trying to decide where it is you're going to put them. Yes, I've seen a lot of people do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, many people are spending a lot of time at home now, whether they want to or not, and they realize they may need some type of separation between neighbors. Now, whether this be a uh, – you when you may need a foliage screen or perhaps uh, a, a for to protect from the neighbors, uh, seeing what's going on in your backyard, and or fi- uh, and a fence isn't a desirable uh, choice. What can we plant in most areas of the country now versus spring to help us develop that uh, perimeter and barrier to keep uh, neighbors' eyes off of what we're doing or just give us a little privacy? Absolutely. Yeah, it's been really interesting as homeowners, as you say, are now home during the times of day when perhaps they weren't previously. There is definitely an increased sense of the need for a, a private oasis. But honestly, you know, we are now in midsummer. And so I would not personally recommend planting major screening trees at this point in the year unless you've got a professionally designed irrigation system on a really sure you can keep it watered. I will give you um, and your listeners a tip. If you desperately have to get a tree in the ground right now, here's what I do, and I've been 100% successful with this. I, When I dig the hole for the tree, I dig it wider than I need, and alongside the tree, I insert sections of irrigation pipe, and that's that four to six inch diameter um, metal pipe, which has got holes in it. And I face the holes so that they're facing the trunk of the tree. So they're right down in the planting hole at the same level at the bottom of the root ball, and they protrude above the soil level about two inches. You then backfill as usual, and when it comes time to water, you pour water directly down those irrigation pipes so the water goes straight down to where the roots are. If you try just standing there with a hose pipe and water a big bald and burlap tree that you've just planted, it is incredibly difficult to get the water to saturate down deep enough and even harder to know if you've got it right. So if that's something you have to do, then do that. But in terms of of screening, you know, I would challenge um, folks to think beyond the ubiquitous hedge. You know, arborvitae, they're as common with you as they are with us and it's probably the most boring plant material on earth you know why not mix it up a bit this is a great time for uh, listeners to assess do i really need evergreen seasoning uh, seasoning uh, screening year round or is it just a problem in summer do i need it at a six foot height or actually is my problem really up to 20 feet tall because it's a second story looking down on me then you can start to do some layering you can intersperse things like column the junipers or the arborvitae Perhaps with broadleaf plants such as privet, you can layer into that column the deciduous trees like the Armstrong maple, which is fabulous. And then layer in front of that beautiful, colorful spirea or regilla or nine bark so that you end up with this beautiful layered garden that really wraps itself around you rather than creating something like the arborvitae, which can very quickly look like prison bars around the perimeter of a property. Um, that really isn't a good look. Well, and you bring up a very important uh, aspect of it, the watering portion, not even just for a tree, but even in these ornamental containers in the front of your house. If they're dry, it, a little water is not going to fix it. You've got to saturate the soil. You would be, people are amazed at how much water it takes to actually rehydrate 
soil that has completely dried out. A gallon or two is not going to fix the problem. You've got to really work at it to get those that soil back where it is actually healthy for the plant. That's right. And with container gardens, I always advise people to water slowly and steadily. Put it on a shower setting. You're not trying to jet wash them. Put on a shower setting. Do it slowly until the water runs out of the drainage holes at the bottom. Because the roots aren't going to grow where the soil is dry. The roots want that moisture. So they, they need the fully um, the full volume of that pot filled with moist um, potting mix for them to grow into that. And, and if, if possible, use some kind of natural mulch on around the plants as well. Absolutely. Just, I mean, even compost is going to be a great um, addition for that. Well, Karen, a lot of great information we've packed into a very short period of time. How can people find more about you? How can they get a hold of your books? Uh, my website is lejardinadesigns.com, and that's going to take you to my blog, event listings, all my books, uh, newsletter. You'll find out about online courses, garden tours I lead, and a whole load more. Um, Le Jardinet is also on Facebook. And to be honest, if you just type in Karen Chapman, garden designer, you'll find about the first 70 hits are me. So I'm pretty easy to find. A <laughs> lot, of, lot of good information, and, and now's the time that people kind of need to evaluate what their, what their goals are because uh, as we're in 2020 and, and beyond, things may not change as much as we hope they to be, and, and you, we may be home more than we're not. Yeah, that's very true. Well, thank you very much, Karen. We greatly appreciate you offering your time not only to us but our listeners across the country. My pleasure. Take care. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.